our hearts as we go into the message today. There's so many people around us, so many people that need to hear a message, that need to hear the good news, the gospel. And so many times we let other things get in our way. We let fear or pride or the thought of the loss of reputation get in the way. 
Lord, I pray that you would work on us today, individually and corporately as a church, as believers, that we would not allow fear or anything else to get in our way on the path of what you've taught us to do. We rejoice in you and we thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for today. I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would speak to us, that you comfort us, that you convict us, that you change us so that we can live on mission for you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the biggest regrets I know in my life is a time when I was in high school and I was in a class with a young lady and I won't share her name in case the video, you know, in case they see the video or anything like that, but I shared a class with a young lady who halfway through our school year told the rest of the class, and, and she sat right behind me, told the rest of the class that she had just been handed down a, a diagnosis from a doctor that she had a severe heart condition. And I remember vividly seeing her shaking as she was telling everyone and, and that she was extremely scared and nervous and worried. And I remember in my own heart, I knew what God was dealing with me in my own heart as a junior in high school that I needed to tell her about Jesus. And she sat behind me for the rest of that year. And I never once shared the gospel with her. Never one time. After we graduated high school, she went to one of the local community colleges and I had heard that while she was there, she was in a swim class. And while she was standing next to the pool, she her heart gave out and she fell into the pool and died immediately. And for an entire half of a year in school, I had the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ with her and I did. And it weighs on me even today. And when I see a skit like we just saw and hear the words of a song, how many of us relate to that as believers that there's opportunities all around us where people are broken and they're hurting and they need to know about Jesus and we allow certain things to keep us from sharing it. Amen. How many times as a church, individually and corporately, do we fail to take that mission in hand to share the gospel? Today, as we enter into our third year, as we enter into, or we celebrate our third year as a church, we're going to push this theme for our next year. We always use our anniversary services to set the theme. For the next year, last year was greater things, and all of you are part of Portico know God's done greater things, hasn't he, through our church. Yes. All we got to do is look around and see where we're at and what's going on and how God put it together and see the people that are sitting here with us today and see the baptisms and the salvations that we've celebrated over the past year. But next, you know, listen, that's not enough, is it? It's not enough. we got a future ahead of us, and we got the need is greater now than it seems like it's ever been. We got missionaries here today going to the Philippines. If you've been paying attention to the news, things are getting a little rocky with the Philippines and the U.S., right? We need big time prayers for them. We need, hey, it doesn't take much to look on Facebook and the news see that our country needs prayers Amen. in this political season. But you know what? All both the Philippines and the U.S. and Russia and China and the entire planet needs, they need what this next verse tells us in Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the waters cover the sea. Amen. The earth needs to know about Jesus. Right. Our country doesn't need a new president to try to save them because whoever wins is not the hope for all of us. Right. Yeah. right? This world and our country, your neighbors, my neighbors, the people that live just the next house over, maybe even less than 100 feet, need Jesus. The people at your workplace need Jesus. The people that you have that grudge against that you've been holding on too long. Amen? They need Jesus. This world needs to know about the knowledge of the Lord's glory. And God has a plan for that to happen. And it's all about sharing His message. You know, we need to change. We need to have a paradigm shift in the way that we think about things. For instance, if I throw a word association exercise up and just throw up this word, church, 
As you think about that word, many things may flood your mind and your heart. When you think about that word, it may bring images such as this. Maybe your background is this old, nice, comfy little country church out in the middle of nowhere where everybody just loves each other. And you go there and you have potlucks after church every Sunday. And you just think of that kind of atmosphere. Maybe for you, it's a, it's a larger church. Uh, maybe it's something that you think about and you see a, the mass of people there and you go and you just see these dynamic uh, opportunities to see uh, worship and to hear messages and things like that. Maybe for some of you, your background is this. You go in and you see these buildings that are just so grand in the architectural style. And, and you just think about how grandiose all these buildings are. And, and, and a lot of people in their history, they think of that when they think of church. Obviously, we don't think that way here. <laughs> what you see is what you get. And yet, for some of you, when you think of the word church, maybe you think of this. You'd like to see it burned down. Maybe there was some Christian somewhere in your life who did not represent Jesus Christ well. And maybe they bashed you over the head with a Bible. And maybe they raked you over the coals. And maybe they belittled you and dogged you and pointed out every little sin in your life. And they demeaned you. And maybe you're here today just because someone dragged you here. And you think, you know what? Church is a scary thing to me. Maybe you're here today and when you think of church, you think of a building maybe like this that represents basically it's just useless. It's dead has no impact on anything around it. And as a matter of fact, everything surrounding it is dead. Listen, we live in a country today where that opinion is growing more and more and more. Maybe you're here today and you think of this next picture when you think of church. You assimilate church to prison. You grew up in a strict church or some church that just belittled you and pointed out every little mistake you made. And you felt like you had this list, list and weight of rules upon your shoulders where if I messed up even the littlest bit, I'm going to be condemned. And let me tell you, there's churches like that. I hope that you'll find that this church is not one of those, but I know that background. And I know that there are some like that. And maybe you're here today, and when you think of the word church, you think of this image. That's just the place where people go on Sunday. They just get together. And you know, sadly, I would say that the majority of Christian churches have this mentality. Especially in America. Sunday is the day when the church gets together. And maybe like some of you here today might be guilty of when you think of church, you think of this. <laughs> Struggling to stay awake. The struggle is real, right? Saturday night, you know, Saturday during the day. Let me tell you something. We're glad you're here. And I'll do my best to wake you up if you fall asleep. And I've got people spread around. No, I'm kidding. Sadly, when you think of the word church, this may be your predominant memory of church or what you think of. Just an all-out fight. And I think a lot of these images break my heart when it comes to church. But this is one I know is such a detriment. To our two churches. The very people of God fighting and arguing, not really over the important stuff, like how can we see more people come to know Jesus, but over all the stupid, meaningless stuff. We've given the Lord's church black eyes after black eyes. Maybe when you think of this in our day and time, you think, well, the church is just a bunch of political people. Is this church boast about the idea that every president of the United States since James Madison has attended services there. And maybe you are here today and you think the church is just too political today. They're too worried about politics and money and all these other things. And to an extent, I'd have to say amen. There's a lot of churches that are that way. And even, I think, the worst of all, when you think of church, you think of this. Maybe that's you. You think that the church is just a bunch of angry people who hates everybody. They're homophobic. They're against gender identity people. They're against sinners. And maybe that's your thought of church today. Let's try another word for word association. When I throw this word up, what does that make you think of? Sunday. Some of you here today, I don't have these images, but you may think, I can't wait to get home and watch football. Right? 
Some of you, when you think of church, it's kind of that same idea. This is the day where people get together and Sunday meetings kind of bring back memories. Some maybe you think, man, that's old fashioned. That's the old fashioned pictures of those those gatherings. Some of you on Sunday was when we throw that word out there. You think of images like this, just a bunch of people coming, sitting and listening to a preacher. And ironically, that's what we're doing here today. Right. Some of you may think of this, the large musical explosions and choirs, and you think of the grand scale of the show of everything that happens on Sunday, and then some may think all they do is sit around and pray. That may be your idea of church, but I want to challenge those ideas. Now, are there good things in those images I showed? Yes, obviously, we're for prayer. This church is for prayer because we realize that's where our strength comes from. When we finally quit trying to do things on our own and we go to God and we talk to Him and we, we just the act of faith is a show of, the act of prayer is a show of faith in itself. Saying that God, we can't handle this, we come to You. Is it good for us to have singing and worship and coming together and, and all these things? Yes. Well, let me tell you something, that is not the sum of all things when it comes to church. That's just the tip of the iceberg. When we look at the scripture and we see the idea of what Jesus had for his church, because after all, the church belongs to him, right? We sometimes forget that as well. When we think of what Jesus had in mind for the church, we see this instead. We see ideas like community, stressing on the word unity. We see people come together. Matter of fact, one of the very first churches that ever existed is the one that sprang and grew forth from the very one that Jesus Christ started himself. I mean, after all, if we're going to get a, a recipe and a description on how to do church successfully, shouldn't we start with Jesus? In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it talks about the church and it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And look at this, to what fellowship? And to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. And this is this idea that this church was together. And it wasn't just a Sunday gathering. It wasn't just, oh, we show up and that's what we do for an hour and a half and we go back home and we don't see those people until next Sunday. It's not that we come in and, and, and check in our spiritual time card and then when service is over, check out and we're done for the week. We see this early church, they had community with each other. It wasn't just a gathering. It was family. It was life. It was doing life together. We see in Acts 2.42 that, that all the believers were together and they held all things in common. See, the church that Jesus designed was to exist as an organism. Working together. Paul even talked about in Corinthians as a body. One body. With several parts, but each part equally important to the other. When we look at scriptures, we see this. And this is strange about what the church is that we see in scripture. The first one, we see the terms like every day. Every day. In Acts 2, 46, it says, Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having favor with all the people. We see a church that every single day is having impact within the community that it is, living in the community that it lived in. We see a living, breathing institution making waves around the people that was around it. It was an everyday church. It was family. It was life. And when we see this kind of idea, we have to first of all deal with this idea that there wasn't a church that owned a building for at least the first 300 years of its existence. They borrowed buildings. This early church in Jerusalem, it met in the temple complex where everybody else was going. Isn't that a strange concept? They met and they fellowshiped and they were together every day. We see another word that comes to mind when we look at the church of Jerusalem. And it's a word that we're not maybe too familiar with. But it's this word, missional. Missional. You see, a lot of churches have forgotten that this is what the church exists for. This word, to be missional. Let me share a verse with you and we'll explain a little bit more what it is. And in the end of Acts chapter 2, or in verse 47, it says, And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Wouldn't it be great? And I know that there's other churches represented even in our audience today. And we want to thank you so much for coming and supporting us today. It means a lot. But wouldn't it be great if even just the churches that are represented here today could see people saved every single day? Amen. Wouldn't that be amazing? 
What would happen if the Cain family get to the Philippines and, and we see that number he gave earlier just exponentially explode and we see people saved every single day in the land of the Philippines and we have brothers and sisters entering into the family. Shouldn't we rejoice with that? Yes. But wouldn't it be great to see that in Porter, Texas? Yes. Or to see it in Humble, or New Cain, or Tascacito, or Houston. Talking about sex trafficking, Houston... We kind of take the cake in that, ashamedly so. We're known as the capital of human trafficking. We see people hurting and broken, broken everywhere. That's just not in the big cities. It's all around us here even today. You may be sitting here today as a broken person. I just want to say, welcome, you're in good company. Because from this preacher and everybody else in the seat, whether they want to admit it or not, are broken. In one way or another, it have been broken. Every day the Lord added. Why? Because they were in the community and they were being missional. You see, attractional is another word that we've gotten very accustomed to in churches. And this is what attractional means. Come and see. Come to us and we'll show you. And yet we never see that mentality or that methodology mentioned in the New Testament. We never see that anywhere. The only thing that we see, the only mind, the only methodology we see is to go and tell. That's what missional means. You see, Sunday ex exists for a great reason. Am I saying we shouldn't meet together on Sunday? No, I am so grateful we're here, and there's a great reason why we should. We try to sum it up in the very reason why Portico Church exists, and we say it like this. Portico Church exists to make God famous Listen, we're not here to make a preacher famous. We're not here to build some Jeff Williams ministry. You'll never, ever hear that in my entire life. We're here to build up the church of Jesus Christ so that people can come to his kingdom, to his salvation, so that they can know him. We exist to make God famous. We don't even exist to make our name famous as a church. We don't exist to make a denomination famous. We exist to make God famous. And how do we do that? By communicating, cultivating, and celebrating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, missional means that we communicate the gospel. We don't just talk about it on Sunday, although we do talk a lot about it on Sundays. But we are to have in our hearts, and listen, Portico, I'm talking to you, especially you, that every single day the gospel is at the tip of our tongues. That the gospel is burning in our hearts. That the, the passion and the desire to share the gospel is overpowering the fear of rejection. Because what we have to understand is the gospel is necessary for us even today. You may have been saved 40 years ago. Let me tell you something. The gospel is just as important to you today as it was 40 years ago. It's just as necessary for you to live the Christian life as it was to start the Christian life. The gospel is necessary. We talk about cultivating and we try to work with other people to help them grow up in the gospel. Uh, to help them understand how the, the fluency of the gospel affects every part of life. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. And here's the best part. This is what Sunday is all about. We celebrate the gospel. When we come here today, meeting here on the first day of the week, as believers at your home church or even here today, we shout to the world that our God is not in a grave. He's not in a tomb. He's not some statue that can't just do anything but sit there. He's not an idol made of hands. He's the all-powerful creator who loved us so much he laid down his life for us and died and was buried. But on that third day, he rose again. Amen. And he rose again on the first day of the week. And when the church comes together on Sunday, don't diminish the impact of meeting together on Sunday. It is a viable testimony that we meet together not praying to a dead God, not trying to persuade some statue to listen to us. We celebrate the risen Savior. We celebrate. That's what Sundays are for. Sundays are for believers to come together as a family, as a community, and celebrate to encourage one another so that we can go out into this battlefield of the world and every single day encourage one another still and share the gospel. Share the gospel. It's the idea of what's known as Missio Dei, the mission of God. That is why the church exists. You see, when we think of church, I pray that we would have a paradigm shift in our mentality, in our methodology, that we would no longer see arrows pointing to a church building, but we would see the church pointing out to the world. We're to go. And Portico, if we don't do that, we're celebrating our third birthday. If we don't fully embrace this, we may never celebrate another one. 
And you may think, Jeff, you're sounding kind of down. No, this is what has to be our passion because if it's not, we're just another social club and we can't do as good a job as some of the other ones. You see, it's all about Jesus. And you may think, man, Jeff, you're sitting here talking about this and there's all this, these different sects of Christianity. And they disagree about this and they disagree about that. Some believe that, that Jesus is coming back at this time and some believe he's coming back at that time. And you know what? We teach what we doctrinally stand on. But here's how what I want you to understand and what's the most important out of that whole discussion that every single one of us believe he's coming back sometime. Right? That he's coming back. Everyone, we may differ on how we do some things, but every one of us stand on the truth that Jesus is the hope of the world. And if the church is operating correctly, we will shine forth that light into a very dark world. The problem is, many times we let we put blinders on that light. Blinders that don't need to be there. We're to be different. Portico, we're to be the missional church. And that's what we're going to set out for starting this next year more than we ever have before. This demand and this commission, this command was given by Jesus. And in one aspect, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he lays it out this way. As the disciples are still there and they've been enjoying company for about a little over a month with the risen Savior. Could you imagine those moments meeting with Jesus after he rose again from the grave? Spending over a month with him, just basking in the fellowship of the fact that no one can beat up our God, right? Nobody can say our God can beat up your God because they beat him up and he came back to life. Right? And then Jesus tells him this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. And you're going to carry the torch. All of a sudden, that emotional high of a roller coaster could come plummeting down. And all of a sudden, this ragtag group of maybe 125 people are looking at each other going, what? And yet we talked about it last week. There was something different in our hearts because it's hard to get scared when the one you know is the Lord, you saw him brutally murdered, and now he's sitting there talking to you. And he says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. This one-time event that happened when, when the Lord Jesus Christ gave the authority and the sealing to the power of his church that he left. And he said that you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem and then in Judea and then in Samaria and then to the ends of the world. And what he's saying there to them today is the exact same thing he's saying to us today. That we as a church are Jerusalem in, in a very literal way is Porter, Texas. Our, our Judea and Samaria is anything beyond those city limits or those town limits as we go further in each direction, heading to Houston, to Dallas, wherever it is around us. That's our Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth or what we get to see today as we have a family that's surrendered their life to go across to another land and share the gospel. You see, the church is that. I don't know what you came here today and what mentality you had about church, but I want this message to maybe if you had those false presuppositions or those misunderstandings of what church is, that the truth would just shatter those. And we could see exactly what the church exists for. The church does not exist to build empires. The church does not exist to have bigger buildings, although there's nothing wrong with that if people are reaching people with the gospel. The church exists. To bring the light of Jesus Christ into a dark world. To see the gospel radically change not only individuals and not only cities, but societies in whole. That's the mission and the purpose of the church. To introduce Jesus Christ and to make God famous into a world that would rather not care. In Matthew chapter 28, we get to the Great Commission. And I know for many of you, maybe this is nothing new. For some of you, it may be. Either way, we have to daily be reminded of why we exist. We have to daily be reminded of that. Jesus himself is speaking to this young church that he's about to leave. And he says, Jesus came near and he said to them, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. I could, we could talk a long time about just that one sentence. Do churches today operate as if they have the authority of Jesus Christ? 
This church is familiar with Ephesians, but Ephesians chapter 3 tells us that the church exists so that we can show forth to the powers of the air, to the dominion, even the demonic and spiritual realm, that you cannot defeat us. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not even be able to stand against it or to stop it. Do we operate as churches like that today? I know the church in Acts did. The church that we just looked at in Jerusalem, it operated that way. And we as Portico Church, as we enter this next year, our heart's prayer is to be that we can take on even the gates of hell and win. Because we have a Savior who has all the authority on heaven and on earth. And he goes on, he says what? What's the first word? Go. Not come. Now there's nothing wrong with you inviting people to church. We are glad that you're here and that somebody invited you. And we're glad to have people come in. But listen, believers, it's not good enough. We have to share the gospel with people. We have to. And he says this, that's what he says. Go, therefore, and make disciples. It's the idea of persuading people to believe in Jesus Christ. That's what it's literally saying. Go and make followers of me. Now we know we don't do the saving process, but we introduce people to the one who does the saving. And then he says, baptize them, bring them into the fellowship, let them have an opportunity to publicly profess that they've trusted in Jesus Christ. And then it says, teaching them, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always. The mission is just that the church exists for that reason. Doesn't mean that we as believers can't get involved in politics. Lord knows we need more of that, right? But what it does mean is that we have to remember that mission in mind if we get involved in politics. We have to remember that God cares a whole lot more about his agenda than America's agenda and our own agendas. Even if we get involved in social activities in which we need to do. Hey, Scripture tells us it's not good enough just to go to someone who's hungry and thirsty and say, hey, be filled and have a blessed day. For too long, churches in a lot of ways have just preached the truth and not shown any love. And then there's a lot of Christians who only show love but don't preach the truth. It's never Jesus' idea. They're to be complementary, the complementary of each other. Love and truth. Meeting people's needs both physically and spiritually. That's what the church exists for. Church doesn't exist to get a certain candidate in office. Church doesn't exist just to tell us all the good things we want to hear. Doesn't exist only to tell us all the bad things there is to tell us. It exists to lift Jesus Christ up so that people that are without him would see him as a refuge. See him as the only source of hope. And it all centers around this idea of the gospel. In Romans 1.16, look what Paul says. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's a key word because what's so important about that word is the words that follow this word. Because it is God's what? Power. The gospel is the power of God for what? Salvation. To everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the You see, the gospel is the life-changing power that has enabled and made available what is called the grace of God. And the grace of God is this undeserved favor in which God just decided, you know what? I created this humanity and he had this all figured out before he did it. And they're going to turn their back on me and they're going to trust in themselves more than me. But I'm going to choose. I don't have to. But I'm going to choose to love them through that and I'm going to provide a way Of recovery for them. And it's going to cost so much. It's even going to cost. My own son. You see the gospel is important. I want to urge you. If you go to a church that doesn't preach the gospel. You need to start praying for your pastor. But guess what? If you're not sharing the gospel every day. You need to start praying for a heart. To share the gospel. Because the pastor is just a human like you are. May the, may the gospel burden us. May we be able to go back when we first heard it. 
when we first trusted in Jesus Christ. Maybe we, with our minds, we can envision Jesus Christ hanging on a cross who didn't have to. That there's no way that we could have made Him do it. That there's no way anyone could have stopped Him from doing it because He wanted to do it. And He died for you and for I. In Philippians chapter 1, we're encouraged to live our life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. We know we could never deserve it, but because if you're here a believer today, because you've accepted the gospel, let's live our life to exemplify the gospel. Now, how do we do that practically? Listen to me. That means sometimes we need to shut up. Especially on Facebook. Especially when it comes to political conversations, right? Sometimes we need to speak up. Sometimes we need to kneel down. Sometimes we need to lift up people first. Sometimes we need to sit down and have hard conversations with people in a loving attitude. The gospel. Living a life that's worthy of that. Well, what is the gospel? I hope if you're a believer today, you can clearly enunciate what the gospel is to someone who doesn't know it. But if you can't, you won't have any excuse after today. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul clearly says, I want to clarify you the gospel. Isn't that important? If the gospel is the power of salvation, if the gospel is the only way we can come to know our creator and know God, isn't it important to know what the gospel is? Now I want you to see the first, the second word in this sentence. What is it? Brothers. Who is Paul writing to? He's writing to believers. He's writing to people who have already trusted the gospel, and yet he's saying, I want to make it clear to you what the gospel is. What is it? He says, you're also saved by it. And he's adding that emphasis there for a reason. You're saved by the gospel. And look what he says. This is the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and then he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, how many of you can look at that, that screen up there and read it out loud? Raise your hand if you're able to do that. Nobody can go from this building and say, I don't know how to tell anybody the gospel. Aren't you glad? Yeah, don't you love it when preachers do that? Yeah. We've all, we can all share this. Now, do we need to find out other ways to meet people's needs and to help them answer the tough questions? Yes, we do. We're doing a whole series of that here at Portico Church right now. We're in the middle of it, answering the hard questions. But here is something that we need to remember. We can't get away from the gospel. We can't. The gospel is first and foremost. The gospel. I want to make this statement to you. And I want you to hear this because as we get close to the end of this message, I want you to really focus on what we're going to be talking about. I want this message to sink in. I want you to think maybe you had all these presuppositions, misunderstandings of what church is on Sunday. Some of you have been hurt by churches. I do want to encourage you a little bit today. I want to tell you that all churches are made up of imperfect people who are going to do things to hurt you. And if you base your faith on the actions of people, you have the wrong source for your faith. There's a responsibility of believers to make things right. And you need to make things right. There's the idea of forgiveness. And you need to forgive even if they do not offer an apology. Maybe you're here and you're bitter about things that's happened in your past. I love the, the old quote that says, you know, when you hold on to a grudge or you're bitter about something with someone, it's like drinking poison yourself and expecting that person to die instead. The forgiveness has enslaved you. You're a prison, prisoner to bitterness and it's affecting your life. You need to forgive them, even if the person's dead and gone. Maybe you say, preacher, you don't know what they did to me. I, I listen, I know horrible things happen to people. In ministry over 20-something years, I've seen and heard and I've had people look at my face and tell me some of the horrible things they've done to people, even their own family members, even their own children. But forgiveness is necessary. Because after all, the whole idea of Christianity boils down to this. The Creator God being nailed to a tree by His own creations and dying for our faults, not His. And before He dies, He says, Father, forgive us. Christianity is built on forgiveness. And we must be a forgiving people. We must be a forgiving people. But I want you to hear this statement. I want you to take it with you. The message of the gospel is of a God who died for broken people and then rose again to make mended people. 
I want you to hear that. If you're here today and you're broken because of something that's happened, I want you to understand, no, maybe that church was at fault. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe that Christian was at fault. Maybe you were at fault. I want you to know if you're here and you're broken today, God was broken on a cross for you. And He rose again so that He could mend you. And He could fix you. And He has mended us. And He has fixed us. And sometimes we revert back to acting like broken people. We do. Amen? We do. We say things we shouldn't say. We, we're, we have biased opinions that we shouldn't have. We treat other people the way we shouldn't because we're, we're flawed. But praise the Lord that He's not. And I want you to know today, if you're here and you're broken, the message of this church, the reason this church exists is to, is to proclaim to you a God, not a church, not a preacher, not a person, but a God who can mend your heart. Because the message of the gospel is all about a God dying for broken people and rising again so that we can become mended people. And he did that for you and he did that for I. And we as a church have to understand that within our DNA, this has to be the utmost important message that we have. The gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a message that looks beyond social statuses, racial divisions. Even borders of countries and nations. And is there anything greater, is there any greater need for our world today than that? We live in a world with all our sophistication and all our education, we still can't figure out how to bring people together. But God knows how to do it. I love my church here, and I say my church loosely because it's God's church, but I'm a part of it. If you're here and you're a member of Portico Church, just stand up for a second. We got some in the back. I want our guests to look around. You see different skin colors. You see different styles of clothing. I, I can't help it that not everybody's hip as me. <laughs> my kids are like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you see different skin colors. You see different backgrounds. You see different nationalities. You see different history. But you know what? Every one of these people are my family. And you know, I love them. And you start talking about them, I may have to revert back into some fighting times. <laughs> but we love each other because we're on a mission for Jesus. And we realize that the biggest common bond we have is that we're a brand new humanity known simply as those that are in Christ. Go ahead and have a seat, guys. And now, Portico, because of that, because of that, we must let this idea invade and, and, and just take over our mentality as a church. The idea of gospel fluency. And what this means is that the gospel is fluent in all areas of life. We don't have to make the gospel relevant. It is relevant. It speaks to every area in life. You may be here today and you're dealing with a broken marriage or maybe your marriage is on the edge of being broken or maybe it was broken a long time ago and you're still just together because you're too ornery, right? Too stubborn. And maybe you have had a broken marriage or maybe your marriage is on the break. I want you to know that the gospel speaks into that life. Because the gospel is all about a God who died for broken people and rose again so that he could make them mended people. And God, through his power, can take your broken marriage when you fully understand what the gospel is about. The fact that God himself laid down his life for you that can enable you to lay down your life for your spouse. Because after all, most broken marriages start there, don't they? Amen? Let's be honest. Right? Most broken marriages, I'm not saying all of them, but a majority of them start with pride. Right? You're not going to treat me that way. I'm not going to do that because I'm who I am. That's not what marriage is, and it's a whole other message. But the idea is this, that the gospel speaks into broken marriages. Listen, believers, we have to believe that. Amen? We have to know that. The gospel speaks, speaks into broken lives. It speaks into broken marriage. The gospel speaks into depression. There's a lot of people dealing with this today. There are some believers, ashamedly so, that would make fun of those people. We need to not do that. We need to introduce to them the one who can change them. 
gospel can speak into a depressed life. The gospel is fluent in the, in the area of addiction. The gospel defeated the worst enemy we will ever have. Every single one of us will face death one day. And for those without Jesus, that enemy will be victorious. But see, we, we serve a Savior who faced that enemy. And he rose again. He kicked it to the curb and said, Death, where is your power? Where is your stain? I took it away from you. If we have a God who can handle death, he can handle depression. He can handle addiction. He can handle broken marriages. And the people in your life need to hear that. Amen. They need to hear that. The gospel can handle pain. The gospel can handle loss. You may be sitting here today and you had a great loss in your life. And you may have even thinking, God, I'm mad at you. Why did you let that happen? Listen, God can handle your anger and he can handle your pain. If you'll draw close to him, he'll draw close to you in ways you can never imagine. And he can help ease that pain and he can bring promise to your life that he says that all good things, all things come together for good to them that love God. There's a, there's a great movie that's out on the theaters. I, I would encourage anybody to go see it called I'm Not Ashamed. It's the story of Rachel Joyce Scott. And some of you, some of you are too young for this, but some of you remember the Columbine shooting years ago, back in the 90s. I think it was 98 or, or so. You remember that story. She was one of the young ladies who was one of the first ones to be shot and killed. She was asked a question, do you still believe in God? And the idea is that it shows this story of her going through these struggles in life and ultimately losing her life as a young teenager in high school. And you may think that that is awful. And it is. It's tragic. We live in a world that's broken, that's evil, that's sinful. We live in it. You know, back in the 90s, we weren't so used to school shootings or mass shootings. Today, we've kind of gotten used to it, haven't we? But it's evil. It's wrong. But can God take something as evil as that and make good out of it? Her story has now reached over 20 million people. I know her family is hurting that she's no longer with them. But praise the Lord, she knew Jesus Christ and that he took that moment to speak into broken lives through her story. And let me ask you this. What could God do through your story? Some of you are here, you're believers, and you've gone through broken marriages. You've gone through depression. You've made it through addiction. You've gone through pain. You've experienced loss, and yet you still know God is faithful. And you have an opportunity to reach out to a world full of people that are full of this in their life. It's all around us. And yet, just like these young people just demonstrated, we fail to take the daily opportunities to share the hope. That is in Jesus Christ. Will you be like them and say, here we go again? Or will you finally stand and say, you know what? I'm going to do it this time. And here's another one. The gospel speaks into being lost. This is a biblical word. Jesus tells us in Luke that the reason he came was to seek and to save those which are lost. And this idea is this, that if you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you are disconnected from your creator. And I want you to understand that that's not his intention. He doesn't want you to be disconnected. He wants you to know him. And he wants you to continually get to know him. And he, he wants that so badly that he made a very clear pathway for you to understand how to come and know him. He sent his son over 2,000 years ago, to be born in a miraculous way, to live a perfect, holy life, and then to voluntarily lay down his life and die for you and I, and to rise again, to change the history of time, to change the future of time, to put forth such clear evidence from creation down to the revelation of the Word of God, to shout to you today, that there is a God and a creator that created you and he did it on purpose with intention. There's a reason you exist. You're not a cosmological accident. There's purpose for that existence. And that he loves you so much that he died for you. 
for your fault and for my fault because we're sinners. I've never met a person in their right mind who would ever tell me I'm not a sinner. We're all sinners and we know it. Ashamedly, there's maybe been some churches in your past who kicked you while you were down. That's not the message here today. The Bible, Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 5, in the very first public sermon he preached, he, gave a, he, he delivered a gospel message that has been unparalleled to any other attempt after that time. He took a perverted religion that that nation had taken from the very ideas that God passed down to his chosen people and they perverted it into some legalistic uh, chess game in which you have to do things right and keep a list of orders to be right with God. And he said that's not what the meaning was. He says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall receive righteousness. They shall, be, they shall receive the gift from God. You know what he's saying there? He's saying this, and I want you to hear this, because here's one of the biggest hang-ups people have. They can't stand religion. I want to tell you, I can't stand religion either. I can't. But religion tells you, here's a list of do's and don'ts. If you accomplish all that, you have a chance to be okay with God. And Jesus said, no. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those that realize that there's absolutely nothing they can offer to a perfect and holy and just God. And when we come to that place spiritually, we understand what relationship is all about. Because in that moment, we place our faith in the one who can clothe us. The one who can fill us. The one who can feed us. And we understand that there's not a list to keep. There's a Savior to accept. Because Jesus kept the list perfectly. And He still laid down His life for us. And so that idea of being lost, if you're here today and you're disconnected from your Savior, I want you to understand that today you can leave being connected. Amen. And it's all because of Jesus Christ. This church unapologetically stands on that claim that Jesus Christ, no other religion, no other man-made form of worship or religious system or religious book or religious deed or religious act will make you right with God. It has to be through Jesus Christ alone and not of yourself. Jesus alone. The gospel speaks into that. If No matter how old you are here today or how young you are, if you're outside of Christ, you're lost according to the Bible in your sins. And that's, a, that's an eternally disastrous place to be. One in which you cannot save yourself from. But the good news, and that's what the gospel means in the Greek, the good news. The good news is Jesus did everything it takes for you to get out of that situation. But you must come through Him alone. Him alone. For those of you who are believers, we must realize that the gospel is still just as important. It's still just as important. And we need gospel saturation in every area of our community, city, marriages, lives, workplace, you name it. We need the gospel to saturate. You know what that has to, what has to take place? <clears throat> if I had a glass up here, and I took a bottle of water and I just started pouring. Eventually, what's going to happen? The glass is going to fill up and the water is going to overflow and it's going to begin to saturate everything around us. What I want to call us to do as believers is that I believe this is what our country needs. I believe it hardly. It's what your neighbors need. It's what you need. We need to repent. That we're not as full of the gospel as we should be. Because if we truly get filled with the gospel, you won't, have, you won't be able to stop the overflow. Everywhere you go, just like if you had a full glass of water and you're turning and you're talking to people, what's going to happen to the water? It's going to splash on people. Here, I'll get this bottle of water to show you. No, okay. It's going to splash on people. <coughs> if we're full of the gospel, Everywhere we turn, everything that's come out of our mouth, we just, it's not going to be able to, it's just going to gospel, gospel, gospel. And when that water hits and it begins to spread, it just saturates. And that's what that early church in Jerusalem did. They stayed there, and on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up, they preached a message, and 3,000 people got saved. And then just a few chapters later in Acts, we see 5,000 people get saved. And we see this huge church, and then all of a sudden, 
persecution takes place and starts going everywhere. And what do we see start to happen? They start to saturate everything in their path. They start to saturate all the way from Jerusalem, all the way to Corinth and Rome, to Macedonia, to England, and even to Porter, Texas today. We're here because of the saturation that that early church did. In Acts 8, 4, it says that they were scattered and everywhere they went, they went preaching the message of the good news. I want to challenge you. We still got time before November 8th, right? I'm not going to challenge you on which way to vote. I want to challenge you to vote. But I want to challenge you this. Over the next few weeks, if you post something on Facebook or you sit down and talk with somebody, I want you to think of gospel saturation, not candidate saturation. Gospel saturation. When you go to work and you sit across the table from someone at your lunch hour, you look them in the eyes. I, I pray that our hearts would see them as, a, as someone who may be lost, who needs to be connected with God. And that you just couldn't help with the gospel. But listen, we need to think about the gospel in our life. Think about the gospel. Because it's all about gospel saturation. And here's the great thing about it. You and I as believers, we need it in our life. We need the gospel. Look at me. We need the gospel to fill us to the brim. We need to think constantly about what Jesus did for us when he didn't have to. Listen, your friends and your family need it. The people that you love in your life, they need you to saturate them with the gospel. Not only that, your enemies need it too. You know those people in your family who are the opposite party of you? You with me? Y'all wake still. Those enemies, you remember that, that person who said something about you in third grade that you can't let go of? Or even that parent or that other person who did something to you that was just totally inexcusable? They need the gospel. They need it. And our world needs it. Our world needs it. So let me ask you, will you take the chance? Will you share the gospel? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, will you trust in the gospel? Where you're sitting today, you don't have to do anything magic. Just within your heart, within who you are, you realize who you are. Maybe there's some hurt in your life and you realize that's there. Let go of it. And just trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in Him. And for all of us that are believers, let's get busy saturating the world with the gospel. Romans 10 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who announce the gospel of good things. Could you imagine our world? Listen, starting with 12 people, and one of them didn't turn out so good. Jesus turned the world upside down. 12 people. Look around. There's more than 12 people here today, right? What could he do with Portico Church? We're praying that he'll do big things as we set the theme for this year is saturated. Listen, church, this year we will focus on getting the gospel message out so we can see people saved, so we can see people baptized, so we can fill this church for God's glory, and we can plant other churches that will begin to saturate the gospel. Amen? So that we can have more missionaries that we can support. So that we can make God famous. And I hope you're on board with this church, and I hope if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you can know him today. We're about to sing another song. Our band's going to make their way up here. And I just want you to listen to me for a moment. We're going to pray. This song is giving you an opportunity to think about what Jesus has done for you. To think about the message that you just heard. And to make a decision about it. And this applies to all of us. Members, non-members, believers, non-believers. You're going to be asked to make a decision about it in your heart. This is an opportunity for you to do that. If you'd like to share that decision with us, if you look around somewhere near you, there's some response cards. You can fill that out. If you have a prayer request, if you're a first-time guest, we'd love you to fill that out because we'd like to send you something in the mail this week to tell you thank you for coming. I also have a gift in the back I'd like to give to you personally and thank you for coming. But more than all that, our biggest desire is that you would know Jesus. If you never come back to Portico Church, and yet you trust in Jesus today, we'll consider that the biggest win there ever, there's ever been. Now, we'd love to come, have you come back. We would. But we want you to know Jesus. And then we want to help you find a church that maybe you could be a part of that will teach you more about it. 
Like I said, there's a good one here. So if you're here today and you're looking for a new church, this is a great opportunity. You can put that on that card. In a moment, we'll take up the offering. You can put that card in the offering plate, or there's a gray box back there on the wall. You can slip it in there. Nobody will look at those cards but me, I promise you. So as we sing this next song, I want to challenge you to think about and make a decision about what you heard today. And that we as a church, Portico, would make our minds up that we're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand as we sing. Because you were forsaken.